So we're now ready to go to God's Word right now. I'd like everybody to please rise from their seats. I'd like us to take a look at James chapter 1. And we will be taking a look at verses 17 and 18 at this time. And in the count of three, I'd like all of us to read together aloud, all right? One, two, read. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. Shall we bow our heads in prayer at this time? Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this wonderful Sunday morning. We thank you for your blessed presence. We thank you for honoring us, O oh God, with your majestic presence this morning. And we rejoice in our hearts that even during our praise and worship, we already encountered you. But Lord, our hearts are hungry still. We still want more and more of you. We want to encounter you in your word, O oh God. We pray that you might reveal yourself to us as we study your word. We pray that our faith would be enlarged. I pray for myself, O oh God, as your mouthpiece, anoint my lips of clay, that as I speak, I might speak in truth, with clarity, and with passion. I pray, Lord, that people might see you for who you really are, a majestic, all-sufficient, almighty, and all-powerful God. And Lord, we submit ourselves to you this morning. Teach us your ways. And whatever is going to be achieved, we will give you back the glory, the praises, and the thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's be seated in the presence of the Lord. I've entitled this morning's sermon, The Absolute Perfection of God's Goodness. Now, in our previous sermons, in our study of the book of James, one of the things that James highlighted was the holiness of God. And the reason why he highlighted that was because there were some believers who were actually thinking that it was God who was tempting them. And that is why it was needful that James be able to establish the fact that the God that we serve is a holy God. He does not tempt anyone. He himself cannot be tempted as well. Now, what James does in this particular passage that we are about to study is he expands further our understanding of the attributes of God. And this time, what he highlights is the goodness of God. And if there is one statement I would like to be able to make this morning, it is the very simple statement that God is good. And we might add with an exclamation mark. God is good with no ifs, and but God is just simply good. Now, His goodness is seen in two truths that we will be studying for the next two Sundays. I'm coming up with a very short series, a two part series, in fact, and we will be taking a look at the two truths of God's goodness. And here we will see James establishing the fact once again that God is never the source of evil. He can never be the source of temptation. So allow me once again to just show you how this series will flow. And so we've got two points based on the two truths of God's goodness. The first point would be a general truth or the general truths on God's goodness. The first sub point would be this. God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Could you say this with me? God is a giver. All right? He is a giver, and He is a giver of all good and perfect gifts. Now, the second sub point is we will see God as the immutable one or the unchanging one. God does not change. 
And one of my favorite verses is found in the book of Hebrews. It states that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we will be focusing this morning on that first truth, all right? But next weekend, we will begin to talk about a specific truth on God's goodness. And under that, we have three subpoints. The first subpoint is God's will, which is our salvation. And then we will see what God used to bring about our salvation, His instrument, which is His Word. And then we will take a look at God's purpose, which is at the time of His writing, those who came to Christ during the time of the apostles were the first fruits among his creatures, meaning to say that there's more coming and we happen to be part of that. So we will just be focusing on the first point, and so we will begin our study this morning. Let's read once again verse 17, but we will just be focusing on the first part. It says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So once again, the first major point is that we find here the general truth on God's goodness. The first thing we have to establish is a first sub-point is that God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Now, what I would like to highlight in this particular passage would just be the first part in this sub-point. And again, reading it to you, it says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. Now, one of the truths that James hopes to establish here is the fact that God is a giver. And I would like to add a generous one at that. One of the Psalms that I happen to love is found in Psalm 81. This Psalm was written by Asaph, and I'd like to focus on one verse in Psalm 81, which would serve as a cross-reference to what we are just studying right now. It says here in Psalm 81 verse 10, I, the Lord, am your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. I like that phrase which says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Now you need to be mindful of the fact that when the writers, when the psalmists were writing their psalms, they had a particular worldview in mind. And that's why sometimes it is needful for us to go back in time and to try to retrace the customs of those times so that we could best appreciate what the psalmist or what the writers were saying. Now, there was one strange custom, actually, that was done during those times. You and I know that many kings at that time were visited by ambassadors, or they had very special visitors. And one of the things that monarchs would do at that time to honor those who were ambassadors or visitors was to ask them to open their mouths. And when they opened their mouths, the king, from his own hands, he would serve them by giving them the sweetest of meats. All right? He would place them on their mouth. And so they would savor the taste of these meats. But aside from that, sometimes when a king would like to be extra generous, what he would do is he would place jewels or even gems inside the mouth of those ambassadors or those visitors. And basically, what does that tell you? Well, that is an illustration of who our God is. God is an even more generous monarch. Amen? He is a greater giver than all these kings. And that is the picture that Aesop wanted to illustrate 
to those whom he was writing to. And that is how you and I are to see our God. Our God is not a stingy God. He is a good God and he is a generous God. If there is one thing that God would like to be able to do in our lives is to pour grace upon grace. And one of my favorite verses happens to be in the Gospel of John chapter 1, wherein if you take a look at the Greek of a particular verse, basically what it is telling is that grace piles up upon grace. And the picture is that of waves of water continually hitting the shoreline. It never ends. It never stops. And that's the truth that you and I experience. The goodness of God never stops for us. God continually asks us to open our mouths wide that He might fill it. And of course, friends, I'd like to remind you that the blessings of God come as a result of our obedience and our commitment to Him. Because that is how God rewards His people. The Bible clearly states that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. And so while we speak about the goodness of God, let us not think that we may simply be passive and sit down and receive the goodness of God without doing anything. He requires us to be loyal and faithful. He requires us to commit ourselves to Him, to obey His commandments, to abide in Him, to abide in His Word, to follow His ways, to obey His commandments, to follow His precepts, to understand His principles. God wants us to do all of these things. And in His goodness, He just pours out blessing upon blessing in our lives. And you and I know that the problem sometimes is that God is invisible to us. And we know that God is invisible, but His hand is not. His goodness is not. In the same way that we feel the wind brushing on our skin, God's goodness is felt by all of us. Coming here, we came in here safe and sound. We're healthy. We're not sick. What does that speak of? The goodness of God. This morning, we had our breakfast what does that speak of? That speaks of the goodness of God, the traveling mercies that He provides, the jobs that we have, the businesses that we have. All of these things come from the good hand of our God. And we need to be reminded of the goodness of God time and time again. And that's exactly what I hope to do. But at the same time, let me tell you, you need to be intentional in reminding yourself of the goodness of God. When God wrote down the book of Deuteronomy through the author Moses, he had one purpose in mind, among many purposes, of course. But the major purpose of the book of Deuteronomy was to remind the people of his goodness in how he delivered them from oppression as they were slaves in Egypt and that now they were being brought into the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. And that is why they were told that they are not to forget the goodness of God. And that is why, friends, if we are to be intentional, one of the things we need to do is that when we wake up in the morning, we need to remind ourselves, what did God do yesterday? What did God do in the previous week or in the previous month? Or what did God do this year for me? And as we do that, that will cause us to enlarge our faith. That will cause us to enlarge our faith in relation to our God. Our worship will be greatly enhanced and we will be inspired to devote ourselves more to our God. We will be inspired to follow Him more. And it is a challenge, in fact, because sometimes we are under duress as a result of our work, the pressures of our job, the quotas that we have to meet. It is so easy to forget about God. That is why there must be a, a determination in our hearts to continually 
bring God before our minds every single morning that we wake up. And when we are about to put rest to our weary heads at night, before we do that, let us also remember the goodness of God because God is a good God. Now, another truth that we see in verse 17 is that God is the source of all, say all. He is the source of all good and perfect gifts. So again, remind yourself of that. If, some, if you receive something good in your life, where does that come from? It comes from the hand of God. If you receive something perfect, again, ask yourself the question, where did it come from? Again, remind yourself that it has come from God. A lot of people place importance on good fortune. You know, fortune cookies, all right? In some restaurants, they still do that. You have this fortune cookie, you break it, and there's a piece of paper that will tell you what's going to happen for you today. Now, let me tell you, whatever good happens to you, it's not as a result of the fortune cookie. Whatever good happens to you, it's not because of good feng shui. Whatever good happens to you, it's not because of coincidence or good luck. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there is no such thing good luck. And there is no such thing as bad luck as well. The only thing I know coming from the Scriptures is that God is sovereign. He is sovereign. And because He is sovereign, He arranges every small detail in our lives. There is nothing that escapes the notice of God. Everything happens as a result of God's permission, God's ordination, or God's anointing. And that is why, once again, if something good happened to you, it was not because you were just fortunate. No, you were not fortunate. You were blessed by God. It came from Him. Amen? So what do you need to do? You need to give thanks to Him. Amen? You need to give thanks to God. And isn't that the call of the Scriptures? The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. We need to do that. We need to continually practice that. We need to make that our lifestyle. Because after all, God created us for Himself. He created us for worship. He created us that, that we might adore Him and admire Him and worship Him. Now, God is not uh, a person who is an egomaniac. The only reason why He requires us to do that is because He is worthy of all praise and worthy of all worship. It is pure righteousness on our part to do what God requires or to do what is right. We cannot worship ourselves. We cannot thank ourselves. That would be unrighteous. Because if we began to worship ourselves, we are thinking that we are the source of every good thing that happens in our lives. We begin to attribute, perhaps, good things that happen to us because of our blood, sweat, and tears, because of our intelligence, because of our resources, because of our connections. Now, while God may use some of those things, we need to remind ourselves, ultimately, when we receive something, it's because God decided that we would receive it. And that is why, friends, we have got to worship God at all times. We have got to have a thankful attitude at all times. Which, once again, brings us back to what we were saying all along, what James has been saying all along. God can never, ever be the source of evil. He can never, ever be the source of temptation. If one of the attributes of God is that He is absolutely good and absolutely holy, then definitely He cannot be the source of temptation. The Bible says only good things and perfect gifts come from above. It's quite interesting here as well that the title that is given to God is the Father of Lights. 
Why do you think this title was given? Because there is no darkness in God. There is no taint of evil in the character of God. There is no sin in God. And that is why we can look up to Him and put our trust in Him because there is no darkness in Him. He is the Father of lights. Everything about God is about light. And when we take a look at the Scriptures, what does light mean? It speaks about truth and it speaks about practical righteousness. So our God only speaks the truth. There is no lie in God. There is no deception in God. He will not attempt to manipulate us. He can only speak the truth to us. And that is why when God gives a promise to us, we are assured that when He makes that promise, He will bring it to pass. It will come to fulfillment because He has promised it and He can never, ever lie. And not only that, when it comes to His own practice, He will only practice righteousness. Our God is absolutely upright. And therefore, our hearts can rest in the goodness of our God. Our hearts can rest in the fact that not only is God good, but He is a generous God. We can rest in the fact that we are safe in the hands of God, that He is our rock of refuge, that He is our strong tower, and we can run to Him and we will be safe. We can run to Him and we will experience His peace. We can run to Him and we will receive joy in our lives. That is who our God is. And such a lofty view of God needs to be placed in our minds continually. We need to remind ourselves of that wherever we are, even at work. When you get the promotion, remember to thank God. Whenever you receive a commendation, remember to thank God. When you receive a salary raise, remember to thank God. And even when you are corrected, even when you are chided for some wrong thing that was, that was done by you, you are to thank God even because that becomes an opportunity for you to grow in character. That becomes an opportunity for you to become a better person. So everything that God brings our way comes from His good, good heart. And that is why, again, we should be thankful to Him. Now, I'd like us to do a little word study because there are some words here which I'd like us to be able to look into like a microscope just so we best understand who our God is. One of the words that you see in this verse is the word good. It comes from the Greek word agathe, which means useful and beneficial. Could you say this with me? Useful, beneficial. Say it again louder this time. Useful and beneficial. You know, sometimes when God gives us something, we may not even realize how beneficial a blessing is. Let me just share to you a little testimony. When my wife was pregnant, on her, I mean, uh, she was pregnant for our third baby. At that time, honestly, I was praying that I would have another son. I was hoping that what had happened to my parents would be duplicated in my case because we were all boys. We were, I, we were three sons. And my mother fondly called us the three musketeers. And that's who we were. And so I was hoping that I would have a third son. My first son's name is TJ. My second, na- uh, the se- my second son's name is AJ. And I was hoping I'd have a CJ. So TJ, AJ, and CJ, uh, meaning Calvin John, because John Calvin happens to be one of my favorite uh, reformers. And he's his an example to the body of Christ. But, you know, my mother-in-law, when she came here, she brought pink, uh, 
pink clothes, pink baby uh, dresses, and I was thinking, this will be trouble. Why did she bring pink instead of blue? At that time, we still did not, uh, well, I don't know if there was, uh, what do you call this, ultrasound. Well, I don't know if that was already present at that time. Anyway, if that was present at that time, we could not afford anyway. So we were really in suspense. And true enough, my mother-in-law was more discerning. Out came not a CJ, but an (laughs) H&M. Hannah Marielle. And right now, in hindsight, I think I'm really thankful to God that my wife and I were given an H&M because she has become a blessing to us. She was a blessing. She had been a blessing to her brother. She still is. She has become a blessing to me and my wife. She still is. And she has been a blessing in church. And today, she was the one who led in song, just in case you're wondering who is H&M, she was the one who was leading in song this morning. And by the way, uh, she is already engaged. (laughs) Hold on, hold on. I can't invite all of you, by the way. She's engaged to the drummer. (laughs) And so I have to disagree with Mark Wahlberg in Transformers when he was advising this young girl not to be engaged with any drummer. Well, my H&M is engaged to a drummer. Praise the Lord. And so praise God for that. God is good. And so there are certain things that come our way and sometimes we don't realize how beneficial these things God gives to us. We do not realize how, how a blessing these things are to us. And that's why, again, here's where we practice discernment. Here's where you and I should become sensitive to God. Because at times, because God is invisible, we tend to put Him in the periphery of our lives. And we just have to remind ourselves, no, God is there. I, might, I may not see Him, but He is there. He is watching me 24-7. And by the way, friends, everything that God does is to be able to serve us. You know, He is a King. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. And yet the amazing thing is our God serves us. When you and I pray to Him, what do you think we're asking God to do? We're asking Him to serve us. When you're asking God for provisions, when you're asking God to heal you, when you're asking God to guide you or mentor you, what do you think you're doing? You're asking the King of Kings to serve you. And you know what? God is delighted to serve us. Amen? Because our God is a good God. Amen? He is a servant king. That's who our God is. Now, there's another word here that we should look into, the word perfect. It comes from the Greek word teleion, which means complete. Say complete. Say it out loud, please. Complete. Lacking in nothing. Say, lacking in nothing. Every need met. Say it out loud. Every need met. Now, how many of you would like to have every need that you have to be met by the Lord? Raise your hands. All right. We want every need that we have to be met by the Lord. And by the way, that is the truth of the name of God that He used in the Old Testament, Yahweh. You will notice that God gave different names in the Old Testament. He used the name Adonai. He used the name Elohim. He used the name Yahweh Nise or Yahweh Rapha. But the name Yahweh is the most distinct one 
for the people of Israel because the name Yahweh was God's covenant name with His people Israel. That was the name that He gave when Moses met God, encountered God in the burning bush. He asked God, what should I say is your name? And He said, tell them I am. And that's Yahweh. And the name Yahweh means this, that He is the all-sufficient one. He is all that you and I need. In other words, whatever needs we have, God is able to meet those needs because He is Yahweh. So whatever it is that you need in life, because He is our Yahweh, He will be able to supply that to us. Unfortunately, the people of Israel failed to perceive that truth in the name of Yahweh. And instead of putting their full trust in God, they began to search for other gods in the Middle East. And they began to worship gods like Baal, Ashtoreth, and many others. They added many other gods to Yahweh. They began to practice religious syncretism. And as a result of that, because they failed to put their trust in Yahweh as the God who will supply all their needs, God chastised them. If you think about the two exiles that Israel experienced, the Assyrian exile and the Babylonian exile, that came about because they failed to perceive Yahweh as Yahweh, the God who is all that they need. And that is something we need to remind ourselves. Not only is our God a good God, not only does God give us good and perfect gifts, but He is all that you and I will ever need in this life. He will meet our needs. And not only that, He will be our sufficiency in the next life. And that is why if you really think about it, what is it that we need to be fearful of? What is it that we need to be anxious with? We should not be anxious. We should not worry. Because our God is Yahweh. He is all that we need. I recall a story of, and this is a very simple story, of a shopper who went to the grocery store. And in her mind, she thought that she had made the right computations in so far as the items that she put in the cart. And the problem was, as she put things on the cashier's uh, desk, she realized that she was $4 short. And so she was digging into her purse, trying to find out if she had $4, which unfortunately wasn't there. And so it was really an embarrassing moment. But then there was somebody at the back who decided to be generous to her. And this man signaled to the cashier that he was going to take care of the $4. And that he did. And the woman was so embarrassed, tried to get the name, catch the name of the person who was so generous. But the man did not want to share his name because he did not want this lady to pay him back. What an interesting story. Sometimes we are at our wit's end and we're digging into our purses, trying to find if our needs could be met. And all of a sudden, God comes to our rescue. Amen? Sometimes we could be in a hospital bed and we're thinking, where's the money going to come from? How will I be able to meet Or how can I pay for the bills? The bills are piling up. And out of God's goodness and out of God's grace, He just sends some quote-unquote angels along our way to bless us. And we realize how good our God is. I mean, we can multiply this so many times. This has happened to all of us so many times. But the question is, were we able to recognize it? When we had those God moments in our lives, did we recognize the invisible hand of God? 
Did we find time to thank God? Sometimes our problem is this. We, we cry out to God. We pray for something. God answers it. We receive it. But when we receive it, we receive it as if we did not even pray about it after all. We receive it without thanking God and praising God for His goodness, for answering our prayers. That at times is where the fault lies with us. And let me encourage you to be more intentional in recognizing the hand of God in your life because He is there for you. He is never against us. One other word I'd like to focus on, we don't need to go into the Greek, but the word above. Every good and perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from above. As I mentioned to you, the good things that happened to us did not come because of good feng shui or because you crack the, the fortune cookie and it says there that it's going to be a good day for you. Let me just remind you, good luck is not really true at all. The truth of the matter is when good things happen to you, it is not as a result of a coincidence. It is not because of good feng shui. It's not because of what you read in the fortune cookie. When good things happen to you, it is because God has decided to be good to you. Amen? He wants to be good to you. So recognize that. Be inspired with what God does in your life. And I'd just like to share to you another story of the goodness of God. There was one man who attended a church gathering like this. And it so happened that one of the more famous preachers was preaching at that time. Some of you may not recognize him. He belongs to the yesteryears of a church in America. His name is Dr. Oswald Smith, but a lot of people still remember him. He was a renowned preacher of God. And he was expounding at that time on the generosity of God. And he also began to speak about Luke chapter 6, verse 38, where it says, Give, and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together. And as he was talking about that, he was, he was speaking so eloquently that this man who was poorly clothed, jobless, was listening intently to every word. He was hanging on every word that was spoken by Dr. Oswald Smith. And while he was listening, he uttered, he whispered a prayer to God. He said something like, God, I'm in need. I'm jobless. But Lord, here's what I promise you. I promise you that if you will supply my needs, I will do exactly what this preacher is saying. I'm going to give to your church. And you know what happened? God was so swift in answering that prayer. In just a few hours' time, he was offered a job. He wasn't even looking for a job. He was offered a job. And the question I'd like to ask you is, how did it happen? Well, very simple. God answered his prayer. Amen? God showed himself good and generous to this man. And when his first salary came, he made, he made true. He, be, he became true to his promise. He gave an offering to the church. God began to bless him. God began to promote him. His offerings increased. God continued to bless him still. He continued to increase his offerings. See, God is a good God. God is able to do over, above, beyond what we ask or even think of. So when good things happen to you, recognize where it comes from. Amen? It doesn't come from your friends. It doesn't come from your company. It comes from above. Amen? All good things come from above. Let's remind ourselves of that truth that is presented to us here. Of course, I'd like to be able to balance things because some of us might think, well, if God is good, 
It doesn't really matter what I do. And some people might even think that they can use the grace of God as a license to sin and live their lives recklessly and do foolish things and think that God will still bless them. Well, let's remind ourselves of this one thing. Yes, God is good, but He is also a God of justice. Don't ever forget that. Because the moment that skips our minds, we might use the goodness and the grace of God as a license to sin, which you and I should never do. Because when you and I mock God by sowing evil and wicked things in our lives, do not expect that you will reap good things, that you will have a harvest of good things. Instead, expect the judgment of God, the discipline of God, the chastisement of God. And, and by the way, the reason why God will do that is not because He hates you, but because He loves you. Because when He chides us, when He rebukes us, when He disciplines us, what do you think is in the mind of God? What is in the mind of God is to bring us back to Himself so that we come to a point of repentance. And as we are restored back, as we, are, as we repent, we will be restored back in good standing with the Lord. And then He could give us His peace. He could give us His joy. He could grant us His favor once again. That is what God intends after all when He disciplines us. It's still our own good. And that is why let us not fool ourselves. One of the things, by the way, that you and I can lose is, is our own peace of mind. I recall somebody who was working in a bank, and he was so scheming, so smart in a bad way, that he was able to embezzle funds from the bank without being traced. I mean, he came away with, with murder, embezzling the bank and not being discovered as the culprit. But you know what he suffered? For 40 long years, he did not have peace. And every year that passed, the load on his conscience became heavier and heavier and heavier until on the 40th year, he decided, I'm going to go to prison. He decided that he was going to report his crime to the police. And so he appeared before the court by that time, a very old man, hard of hearing, and he confessed to his crime. The judge who was hearing his case showed him mercy, felt that he was too old, and after all, he had suffered already for 40 long years with that heavy load on his conscience. And friends, let me just tell you, that's what we can lose. You can have all the money in the bank, you could have a nice house. You could have all the material things that you, you are so obsessed with. But let me tell you, what is that if you do not have peace of mind? What is that if you do not have the joy of the Lord in your heart? That would really be nothing. And that is why even as we speak about the goodness of God, let us remind ourselves that He is also a God of justice. Now we go to the second point, and it is this, that God is the immutable one, the unchanging one. Take a look at verse 17 once again. It says here, and this time we'll focus on the last part, it says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. The focus here is with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Lest we think that our God might change or even change His mind or be changed in his attributes, I think we need to be reminded, and James is reminding us, that God never changes. 
He was good yesterday. He is good today. And He will be good tomorrow. Amen? He was good from eternity past. And He will be good in eternity everlasting. God will never change. And that's why I like Hebrews 13 verse 8 which says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? That is our Yeshua. That is our Jesus. He never changes. And that is why we should not fear in our hearts. We should never ever be afraid. Because the dealings of God with mankind will never change. We've seen that in the thousands of years that God dealt with man. God in His goodness dealt with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God in His goodness dealt well with Noah. God in His goodness dealt well with Joseph. He dealt well with Moses. He dealt well with all the prophets of God. He dealt well with Peter, James, and John. We have seen the goodness of God for thousands of years. For, for the thousands of years that man has been in existence, the only thing that our God has done in our lives is good. Amen? He has been good. He will always be good to us. Amen? And praise God. That is the God that you and I serve and worship. We are not worshiping a false God. Thank God we worship Yahweh. Thank God our Savior is Yeshua. Thank God that we are so blessed, sometimes we don't even know how blessed we are, how privileged we are. The Bible says there is no shifting shadow. My daughter was sharing about the sun. Let me just share another thing about the sun. When the sun shines at different times of the day, you and I know that the shadows, our shadows become a little different. When it's noontime, when the sun is up, what happens with our shadow? Is it long or is it short? At noontime, your shadow is very short. But when the sun begins to set, what happens to your shadow? It becomes what? Your shadow becomes longer. So depending on the time of the day, your shadow will differ. And that's the picture, picture that James is trying to show to us, the shifting shadows as a result of the different positions of the sun during a particular time in the day. And you know what James is trying to say? God is not going to be like that. He's not going to be short on you at certain times in your life, nor is He going to be longer at certain times of your life. He's just, he's just going to be consistently good in your life 24-7. You can expect that He will be good to you. Now, I know sometimes we don't feel that God is there. I know that there are times in our lives when we think that God has deserted us. I know that there are times when we're speaking to God and we're wanting to hear His voice and it seems like heaven is silent. I know how that feels. I've been there in that same spot and in that same place. But you just have to trust the Lord. One of the exhortations in the Bible is that we need to wait upon the Lord. Sometimes our problem is we want instant gratification. Sometimes our problem is we just pray today, we want the answer right now. But you see, you need to understand that God is doing something in our lives. 
When he, when he delays seemingly in his answer, he's doing something. Maybe he's stretching your faith. Maybe he's stretching your patience. Or maybe he's developing your character. But remind yourself, he is not like a shifting shadow. It is not like God is treating you less right now. In fact, the truth of the matter is God always treats us better than we deserve. You really think about it? What do you and I deserve? We deserve to go to hell. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that's what we deserve, condemnation. Instead, what does Jesus do? He dies on the cross for our sins. That's what He does. Now, if you doubt the goodness of God, I would just like to submit this to you. Look at the cross. Look at the cross. Look at the crown of thorns. Look at the nails on His hands. Look at the nails on His feet. Look at the, the side that was pierced, the blood that was flowing from the crown of his head. Look at his back filled with, with blood as a result of flogging. Look at the cross. Look at the man. And if you still doubt the love of God, if you still doubt the goodness of God, I doubt if there is anything in the world that will convince you of the goodness of God. Friends, if there is one thing you and I need to be reminded, in so far as God is concerned, there is no lack of evidence in so far as the goodness of God is concerned. What has happened, however, with us is we have suppressed the truth of God's goodness. And that is why as a church, we're all called upon by God to be witnesses. Witnesses of what? Witnesses, of course, of the gospel, of His death, His resurrection, the paying of the penalty of our sins. But likewise, we are called by God to be witnesses of His goodness. Wherever you go, you need to be talking about the goodness of our God. Amen? Because anything less than that, we are dishonoring our God. Thank God our God doesn't change. In Kyoto, Japan, there is an unusual place. It is called the Temple of the Thousand Buddhas. And literally, there are a thousand Buddhas in that temple. And those who worship Buddha go to that place. And the question is, to which Buddha will they go to? Because there's a thousand of them. And here's what the people thought. They would go to the Buddha that looks like them. <laughs> That's where they would pray. Praise God, we don't have to go to a temple of a thousand Buddhas because there is only one God and one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. What a great comfort to know. That our God is a good God who is a giver of every good and perfect gift. And that our God is unchanging. As such, our faith should be firm that God will never ever be the source of any evil nor the source of any temptation that comes our way. And just like the song, as the song goes... God is good all the time, and all the time, say it out loud, say it out louder, say it out loudest, amen. Give the Lord a big hand, please. God is good. God is good. Let's pray.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for just reminding us of who you are. Indeed, Lord, we need to be reminded, as in the book of Deuteronomy, of all the good things that you've done. And we can look forward to more good things taking place in our lives. Not because we deserve it, but because you are simply gracious. And today I pray, Father, that you might increase the faith of your people, increase our love and our trust for you. And we pray, O oh God, that your mercies will just be poured out in our lives today. We pray for those who do not know you, that they might come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Even right now, touch their hearts. Let them have an encounter with you. Let them come to you, O oh Jesus. We thank you for this morning. We thank you also that we could give our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings. Lord, use them for the glory of your holy name. And would you be so kind to bless and prosper us, not because we're greedy, but because we just want to serve you and bless your name and bless your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand, please.